You know what? When I had I, when I had problems like that, it was because my Zoom. Thanks so much for your patience. We have the fun um, process of Zoom updates and weather travel advisories. Um, so we are just trying to get situated a little bit um, as we get some of our panelists through. So thank you for your patience. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule today. So, um, but we are excited uh, for today's conversation. Um, right now we have Xander Keg with us. Um, and then eventually we will get Avalissa um, Ellicott and Landon Marchant with us as we are um, waiting for them to join us through either um, just tech funness with Zoom updates. And then Avalissa is traveling, um, I think got impacted by all the snows that are happening up north. Um, so, but it should be a fun, exciting conversation that we have going on. Um, okay. Just taking a look to see if Landon was able to get in through the Zoom side. Not yet, but what we'll do, um, I'm Linnea. Hi, everyone. For those who I haven't met before, Linnea, he's on the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Warrior Scholar Project. Um, and so really excited for today's conversation and, um, with Xander and Avalissa and Landon um, when they're able to join us. And so um, to give a little backdrop and kind of like talk um, and hopefully time will work with us a little bit um, is we're here today for Transgender Day of Visibility. And I'm gonna give a little bit of history and context for my experience, um, but then also recognizing the intersection with the veteran and military connected community. So um, I'm a military spouse and you know have been an ally of those who are serving in our military or identify as being veterans um, and in the transgender community. But over my time, um, you know, the tra being transgender or the transgender community has been well known well beyond um, throughout the 20 today. Um, we'll leave it at that. And so um, it's been embedded in our culture, specifically in the American culture since its founding, but then in the global context, identifying as transgender dates all the way back um, before America was even founded. And some would argue early records of transgender were framed under nonconformity, which is another way of saying that females should identify or act as X and men or males should identify or act as Y. Um, and this resonated with me because I'm a professional opera singer. So pants roles were very common in the high arts and music industry where um, the opposite gender was casted to play another part that was typically not identified with their gender or their sex. And so I was able, it wasn't foreign to me in that capacity. Um, and so, but yet, the transgender community for so long has been invisible. And so that was either for reasons of public ostracization or um, a justification for society to specifically exclude them, or just fear for being targeted with violence um, because there was a phobia um, against this population. And so, um, and we have legislation all the way to the bathroom bill, um, sports legislation, how teachers should inform parents, leading to this trend of, I would say, misinformed um, and negative attention to the transgender community population. So, um, President Biden last year um, designed and declared on March 31st um, that the day should be recognized as Transgender Day of Visibility, which is designed to engage um, and support and celebrate the accomplishments of the transgender community in our society, as well as honor the lives lost of those who identifying as being transgender or advocating um, for the transgender community. So while today isn't March 31st, I know it's the 15th, um, we got a month, March is a really busy month um, in a lot of ways. So, um, but we wanted to bring together some great folks to help us with um, celebrating and learning, especially as allies 
and how we can support our military and veteran community, specifically of those who identify or are part of the transgender community. So um, eventually we'll put in the chat um, everyone's bios, but I wanted to give out a few minutes um, for each of our panelists. And I see that we have Xander here, you know, just ready to go representing. Um, so I'll let Xander just tell us a bit about your story and um, your military experience. And we'll start from there. Thank you, thank you, Lanaya. And thank you for the invitation to be part of the panel. It's a real honor and joy. So, Let's see, I'm not sure exactly what's gonna go in the chat box, so let me just cover a few points. So, um, well, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, a Mexican Catholic family, I'm first generation Latino uh, trans man. I serve on the board of directors for TABA, which is the Transgender American Veterans Association. Uh, we were founded in 2011 by Monica Helms and Angela Brightfeather. Monica Helms is the designer of the trans flag that flies everywhere around the world now. So that pink and blue and white flag was designed by one of our founders. Um, I served in the United States Coast Guard in the 1980s. So that was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. People might refer to that as the witch hunt days, but I was in the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard was Department of Transportation at the time, not Department of Defense. It still is in its Homeland Security now. And so there was, it was a very different culture and a lot of, um, you know, it was very different from being in the other branches. I chose it specifically. I, I didn't want to go into the other branches of the military. I, I work as a licensed clinical social worker. I've worked at the Department of Veterans Affairs and also with the Department of Defense. When I worked at the Department of Defense, I was at Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego, California. I spent three and a half years as the clinical case manager of the Navy Medicine West transgender care team. So I spent three and a half years working exclusively with active duty sailors, Marines and Coasties that were um, command approved to go through gender transition. So what I did was I developed and I, um, managed or coordinated our intake and orientation process and our database. And then I attended bi-weekly meetings um, to keep track of the progress of all of our patients that were going through the, their um, transgender care team uh, process. I live in Orlando, Florida with my wife, Margaret. She's a marriage and family therapist. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary last September. So we're rounding, we're coming around to 21. Is that quick? Um, hmm. Maybe that's enough. They're, yeah, I want to, you know, sort of bait the hook a little, you know, not give too much away. I um. I appreciate. I, yeah, well, I was going to say I like that you're, you know, the warrior scholar thing. You know, I was um I was in special education as a young person and struggled a lot um, in school, not because I wasn't intelligent, but I had behavioral problems. And so I got tracked into special ed. I ended up dropping out when I was seventeen, and um, sort of you know, went around the country doing some odds and ends things. And then when I was 20 years old, I took the GED and the ASVAB all in a short period of time and scored well enough on the ASVAB that I could enter into the Coast Guard. And so that's what I did. So it's, you know, I was a little late to the party. Most people enlist when they're 17, maybe 18. So I was, I was the oldest person in my um, company. And uh, so that, you know, it's just a little bit interesting. And then I was 30 when I went to college. So again, you know, um, non-traditional student as they used to call it, I'm not sure what they call it now. And so I went from a high school dropout to not only a co college graduate, the first in my family actually to graduate from college, but also I went to graduate school and I have three graduate degrees. I have one in conflict resolution, one in theology, and then the, the last one is in clinical social work. And a lot of people think, wow, you must really like school. And I said, well, I did enjoy school, but that's not why I went to college. I went to college because I was getting to the place in my career at the time where I was going to be required to wear professional women's clothing, and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> So I, I took a detour and thought, I'll just go to college and wear, you know, wear my shorts and, and my Vans tennis shoes and, you know, and, and I'll see how long I can pull that off. And I ended up being in the academy for 10 years. So, you know, yeah, That's had to amazing. escape. That's amazing. And thank you for sharing that context. We were actually having a conversation uh, yesterday with a couple of us, especially amongst the veteran population, what we call stop gaps. So recognizing that there are a number of veterans who started college at one point and it just that that's when they realized it wasn't a good fit. And then um, then there are others where, um, you know, they they 
they even knew right out of high school, like college isn't a good fit. So then they waited and, and did their service. And so recognizing the different pathways into higher education is really important. So thank you for sharing that. And that's that tie in in terms of, you know, why you stalled. Well, uh, absolutely. Let me mention one thing. I did one of those kind of sort of fill the gaps. Um, I was in Denver, Colorado. That's where I went to college. And the reason I ended up in Colorado is because they had a program uh, called Veterans Upward Bound. So Veterans Upward Bound is, is through the, the US Department of Education. It's one of the triple S programs like disabled student services. And so Veterans Upward Bound, I went through that. It was maybe a three or four month program and it came with automatic admission to the college if you completed it. So it was a really wonderful program. Awesome. Yeah, we actually had a team member tabling uh, this past weekend for vet Veterans upper, Upward Bound. So Maybe. glad to see the, the product of that. Yes. And I see that we have Avalissa joining us. Um, so I'm glad that your plane landed safely, hopefully. Um, so and that hopefully everything all is well. Thank you so much for joining with us. And um, just wanted to have you share a couple moments and tell us your story um, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Of course, sorry, I was struggling to get the, uh, <laughs> get it unmuted. Uh, my name is Avalisa Ellicott. I am an Air Force veteran. Uh, I, my story is very interesting uh, because I was in during uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, pre-transition. And so I, I knew that I wanted to transition before I went into the military and I was kind of waiting out those four years so that I could get out. Um, and while I was in, it, it got to a point to where I was feeling comfortable expressing my, my femininity to an extent, um, but still able to do my job. But somehow that became the largest problem ever was the fact that when I wasn't in uniform, I had boots with a small heel on it or while I was in uniform, I may have some concealer on my eye bags. Um, people took, you know, a, offense to that. And I was being constantly persecuted over it uh, to try and be kicked out during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, under the rules of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. They went through all types of hoops to try and get me out under that. And it was really hard and honestly disheartening to the point to where when I did get out of the military, I wanted nothing to do with my military identity, my veteran identity. I just wanted to completely separate from it because it was so scarring having to live that all the time. And then after I got out, I transitioned and slipped and fell into advocacy and <laughs> started, you know, doing all of these things that other people saw as advocacy. And I just saw as, you know, I don't see anybody else doing it that looks like me. So I, I should do it so that if anybody else is looking, it's out there. Um, and then I remember sitting in a green room <laughs> at a news station and I was like, hmm, well, I think, I think that this is something a little different than what I thought it was. I think this is actually advocacy. And, and through that, uh, I have started, you know, re that connection with my veteran identity and being able to be a proud trans veteran and, you know, be proud of my service and not let anybody take that away from me. Because so often that that is how it happens. People try and take that away from you because they don't understand how you can be both and they don't understand the intersectionality of, you know, multiple identities. Uh, and so, yeah. Now I'm the vice president of TAVA and doing a lot of education, trying to help people understand uh, the issues that we deal with and the ways that, you know, they can use their privilege to help change the world. Thank you so much, Avalissa. That that really resonated, um, especially during my time when I was overseeing a veteran's office um, and how... I had administrators be really surprised that we had students who did not want to self-identify as being military connected and, you know, really highlighting that there were some folks who served in our military that 
that was a painful and dark time for them. And um, for various reasons, whatever that look, um, however that looks and hearing how you have channeled that, I always say we fall into advocacy in different ways, um, but how you have channeled that in a way to advocate for others, um, especially those who served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, to say, you know what, it, it, this isn't an either or, this can be an and, and let's find ways to support each other and um, connect to resources. So thank you for sharing that. And then I also see that we have Landon joining us who um, is facing some, some fun northern weather. Um, and speaking of my time at Georgetown, that's actually the first time I met Landon was when I was at Georgetown and we had an amazing program called Warrior Scholar Project on campus. Um, and so I'll let you take a few moments just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story. Awesome. Thank you. I apologize to everyone for being late. It is our Easter weather out here. Um, and as mentioned, I fell into uh, I fell into the veteran student space through Warrior Scholar Project in a very similar way to how I fell into advocacy. So I left the military during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, I experienced nearly two years of consecutive uh, sexual assault and harassment in order to make me a proper woman. That clearly didn't work. And um, I, in the process, I found a lot of really good people, but it wasn't enough to save my like career. Because um, this was also before certain policy changes had happened that would have helped with my career. Um, and then, uh, after there, I ended up in a skilled trades program, which is how I uh, actually found um, OutServe and eventually Sparta. I helped found Sparta and was part of the beginning cohort who really built that up. And at that time, I was in DC and I was working construction as a plumber while transitioning and just didn't really feel like the other veterans I met. I there is veterans all over DC who would be like wearing the hat with the things and the logos and the whatever. And it's just like that it didn't really jive with me. I couldn't figure out why. I figured it was just because of the flavor of my service. Maybe that meant I wasn't a real veteran. And then I went to community college and ended up at Williams College of Massachusetts where I spent four wonderful years. And that's also, I've stayed in the area, which is why I now I'm 20 inches deep in snow. Um, and it was really eye-opening and lovely when a fellow student, a veteran himself who had served 10 years in some of the most incredible missions and environments and is a dear friend of mine who's currently at Harvard Medical, he looked at me and he was like, your service is just as valid. He's like, you're a veteran too. And uh, like, I don't, words would have fallen short. So I think I just said, thank you. <laughs> And I've kept that really close since 2016. Um, and that's really helped with shaping my experiences as well as my identity um, as a veteran, because I've done a lot of work in the um, trans advocacy space, both in organizations and grassroots organizing policy work um, now with Minority Veterans of America and um, academic research on the transgender military service experience. So I have a broad range and it feels at times like I hadn't left the military until recently when I started paring back on all the things I did. But it also meant that I spent many years feeling like the way to make up for not feeling like I belonged or the way to make up for my service was by taking care of others. So if I could make sure nothing happened, like I had done everything in my power to take care of somebody else so that what happened to me wouldn't happen to them, um, or so that they could have access to the resources, then that really, like that, that made a difference to me. And that felt like I was helping past me in a way um, without sounding like really self aggrandizing It was like a, like a healing of trauma type of thing. <laughs> and it also was really lovely to watch people go through and have their lives transformed the way mine's been transformed. So I started off at Warrior Scholar. I was actually waitlisted for Williams as a transfer and then I ended up at Warrior Scholar and found out that I had been accepted off the wait list the last day of the program. Um, I believe I ran out of the room. We were having brunch with some important general. <laughs> he was giving a very like casual talk and he had been out for 18 months and had his hair down to here. It was just having the best time. 
And I ran out of the room and to start making phone calls about like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this just happened. And it was really a wonderful introduction to academics as well, because I had been in community college, like I said, and I had been in trade school, but the Warrior Scholar was a weekend artificially compressed to make deadlines. It was artificially compressed deadlines with a lot of lectures and thinking, and what does it mean to be free and what is democracy that really made me excited to go to a small liberal arts college and it also was a space where my ideas mattered more than like if my voice cracked or if my hairline wasn't perfectly cut in and all of these other aspects of identity that I was used to having monitored so yeah that's me it's nice to see you all that's awesome and, you know, I appreciate you sharing, Landon, you know, the ways in which certain either conversations or services and resources served as a catalyst to feel like I can be my authentic self, again, recognizing that intersection. So I'm interested to hear either from Xander or Avalissa, like, what was the catalyst for you? Were there particular resources or services that you utilized to, um, I guess, in, feel like you had the agency to um, be your authentic self and recognizing that intersection of identity. I can't think of a specific service uh, that I utilized. Uh, for me, I was so separated from my veteran identity when I started my transition, when I started you know, authentically uh, living the way that I felt that I should have should have always been. Um, so I was pretty deep into transition before I even started going to the VA for um, for hormone therapy and things like that. I think a lot of it was uh, community support and and finding that outside of my veteran identity beforehand. It wasn't until, you know, I was fully established in who I am that I actually met again, because I, as a black trans woman, I'm constantly dealing with intersectionality because in, in all of the different spaces where I exist, I am some type of minority until you break it all the way down to black trans women. And then, you know, I have the privileges of being uh, well-spoken, of being cis-assumed, of being able-bodied, of being financially stable. But, you know, when I'm in all of these other different, um, in these other different groups, I sit in, in a place from being marginalized. And so um, a lot of, of me working through my identity has been working through those intersections um, and it hasn't been until recently that I have started, you know, including the veteran spaces in that and, and trying to break down a lot of the, the barriers that exist for trans veterans to be proud trans veterans. So, well, I've been a veteran since 1988. So my veteran identity, so to speak, I don't really refer to myself as having identities like that, but my status as a veteran uh, st started in November of 1988. So I've been using the VA since then. So I was already well integrated into the VA culture, the veteran community uh, in San Diego, California, where I, where I was serving and then living afterward. I'd say a couple of things happened. One, I started hormones at the VA in Northern California, um, in Martinez, California, which is, Con which is um, Contra Costa County, right above Oakland and Berkeley. I started my hormones there in 2004, and this is before there was the, the official national policy that you could transition. Um, but there were always exceptions. There's always exceptions and there's always waivers. And so I was one of the exceptions, uh, one of the many exceptions back in the day. And so back then what I had to do is get my prescription from outside of the VA 
and then bring the, the slip to my VA primary care provider and they would enter it into CPRS, the database system. And then I would be able to pick up my prescription at the pharmacy or get it mailed to me, which is what I chose. So that was in 2004. And then I became an employee as a social worker of the VA in, um, well, as an intern first in 2010 and 11, and then an employee starting in 2012. And then I had the opportunity to be part of the national LGBT, what was called then LGBT, it's now LGBTQ health program that was out of our central office in, in the DC, probably Alexandria area perhaps. And so I was part of that team where we developed trainings for staff and we also um, were reviewing, de devising and, um, and uh, developing uh, policy, what is now called the Transgender Intersex Veterans Directive, right? I was part of that team. And so I, I, was, I worked on that team until 2016 when I left to go work with the Navy. So I've, I've sort of been in, in, involved in that the whole time. I, I can't really separate out, you know, being a veteran, being trans. I'd also like to say, because um, I just, I like to add this in as a piece whenever I'm talking to people. I consider my lesbian self authentic just as much as my trans self. And so I didn't all of a sudden become an authentic person when I started testosterone. I was a very out young lesbian at age 14 in my high school. I was dating a cheerleader in my high school at the time in Los Angeles, um, was out to my family. And so I was very visible. And even though I was in pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I had a lot of gay and lesbian friends on, on the base and I, I lived in community eventually and I was awarded Ms. Gay Pride while I was serving on active duty and rode in the Gay Pride Parade. And I'm saying it like, cause that's what we called everything back then. So I'm just sort of using vernacular from the, the olden days. Um, and so that, I mean, so I was very much just living my life. Um, I don't need anybody's permission to live my life. So I, I just do me, you know, and that's just my personality. It's, you know, they used to call it, um, incorrigible. Now it's oppositionally defiant. Like I'm just sort of a, you know, countercultural person. So, yeah. But that's not true for everybody. Some people really feel like they're hiding who they really are and they're, con they're concealing it. They're suppressing it. They're denying it. I've never had to do that. So I, I feel very fortunate about that. I have a wonderful family. And anytime I ran into issues, um, I never internalized it. So if people had problems with me, that was their problem. I never took it inside as a problem that I needed to take on. Again, that's just, I think, my personality. Thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Xander, for also highlighting, you know, it wasn't necessarily, like, it was not necessarily a change in understanding who you were. Um, you know, it's all, again, that intersection has many layers of meanings, um, so to speak. So that was really helpful. And, you know, I'm jumping around a little bit in the questions as you were identifying the, um, you know, it was, you were, it, it's your, in your nature to have and share and be forthcoming in terms of your visibility of who you are with others. And while that might not necessarily be the case for others where they might be um, sheltering or being very um, strategic in terms of who they're telling. So I'm curious to hear as we come together for a day of visibility, what does it mean to be visible in our society today, especially amongst the transgender community? So I guess to rephrase that question, what does it mean to you? Um, and that's to anybody who wants to go first in terms of the what does it mean to be visible in the transgender community? So while Xander had the amazing experience of being able to be authentic throughout the majority of his life, however he identified. For me, I was shamed as a child when I said that I was a girl. I knew it from a very young age and I was shamed. I was told that I was gonna go to hell. I was told that, you know, I, I, I saw instances of, of the lives that trans people had before them um, from what I saw in the media, from what I heard from my family, you know, I saw, I heard slurs being thrown around as a child. And so I kept it to myself. And even when I knew that there was something that I could do about it, even when I knew that there was something I could say about it, 
I was, I was always worried how it would reflect on my family, how it would reflect on my mother. And so I did hide for so long. And it wasn't until I was about 19 that I actually met my first trans person. And she was a trans woman. And that's when I realized that there was something that I could actually do about it. I could actually make my outside how my inside was. I could make the match. And so it was the visibility of seeing someone who had that identity that showed me that it was a possibility. And now, you know, it, it, it's not a question. We understand that there are trans people and they come in all different shades of the spectrum and their experiences are completely different. And now the visibility is about being completely visible with the lives that we can live because for so long the narrative has been that we, <laughs> we don't live long. Uh, the narrative has been that we end up in jail. The narrative has been that, you know, we get murdered brutally and things like that. And so it's about being visible, not only with our struggles, but with our joy and with our success. And so that's, that's what's really important for me when it comes to Trans Day of Visibility is making sure that our success and our joy is just as visible as our pain and our struggles. Thank you for that, Avalissa. That was really powerful. Thank you. You want to go, Lander? You want me to go? So, well, I, I wanted to just say one thing just so that people understand. Um, I didn't escape the messages of attempting to shame me. I just don't shame easily. So, you know, like, I mean, re Mexican Catholic family, you, you know, the messages were there. <laughs> I just didn't listen to them because I didn't care. Um, but again, sorry, different personality. I'm oppositional. Um, I think the idea about visibility that I really love is being visible in spaces where they don't, people don't think we exist. So I don't spend a lot of time hanging out with uh, people who, who already know me, already accept me, and already welcome me. I actually like to spend uh, some of my time, I spend most of my time actually with my wife. I'm, I'm not too social, um, but you know, I did that in my 20s and 30s and 40s. I'm, I'm almost 60 now, so I'm like, I'm, I'm done with that. But I, um, I like to spend time with people that the assumption might be, oh, they're not gonna accept someone like me. And then I go into those spaces and lo and behold, that's just not the reality of it, right? I live in Florida. So people are always like, oh my God, are you in danger? And it's like, no, I'm not in danger. Um, and, you know, and so uh, like I, when I was living in San Diego a few years ago, I joined a liberal evangelical church because I did, at the, I sort of knew the difference between conservative and liberal evangelicals, but I still thought, well, they're evangelicals and they had so many gay and lesbian people in their congregation. And so I was the only trans person, but it, it was not a big deal. I wasn't like, I didn't have to be like, hey, I'm trans, I'm trans, I'm trans. Like it didn't matter, but uh, they knew I was. And so I was visible in that way. And so I, I like that. I like hanging out with people that are more uh, maybe center uh, in their politics, center right even. I'm more of a libertarian myself. So I like to hang out with people that um, might benefit from listening to a person who's not going to call them out or not... Um, not challenge them in, in, in too many ways, in a harsh way at least. Um, I just wanna live by example and I wanna be able to build bridges and uh, with people so that we can make inroads going forward as a society rather than splitting up into all these different siloed pockets of society. I don't think that's gonna benefit us in the long run. And so I, I hang out with people that shouldn't like me and they end up liking me anyway, so. I feel like it's, you know, it's some kind of service that I'm still giving, you know, in some way. Go ahead, Landon. Thank you, Xander, okay. that was helpful. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if we were doing the transition handoff or not. Um, so uh, I think my experience and my understanding of being visible falls in a, Almost in the, sorry, I have a large puppy if you can hear the. Um, so I grew up in 
rural Wisconsin. I was homeschooled to um, very loving evangelical parents. Um, and uh, I, in many ways, my upbringing was idyllic. Um, I mean, I had a pony for my 16th birthday. Like we had sheep, all of these things. Um, and also because of the particular brand of faith I was raised in, um, I grew up believing I was an antichrist and that anyone who loved or cared about me would be damned to hell because that's who I was, because I could not be saved. Um, and I'll save the particulars of the theology for another time when we have alcohol. <laughs> um, and there, there were these messages and sometimes overtly, uh, many times overtly and other times less so that, I mean, at one point I was told that um, LGBTQ people die alone, penniless, poor, and um, are, and were equivalent to being possessed by the devil. And I was told this by a very close family member. Um, and so that's the kind of messaging I grew up with on one hand and not even knowing really what it meant to be LGBTQ. I just knew that I liked girls and I kind of liked boys, but not nearly as much. And I didn't even have language for that. And so it wasn't until 21, 22 in like 2000 and I think 11 ish, when I discovered that trans meant some, like that was a thing other than like the transcontinental railroad. And so then I began my transition. I started at the VA because I had no money. I was discharged from the military with $800 and like a couple of days notice. So I was like, where are my benefits? I'm going to use those. And I actually started before the policies that Xander worked on were taken into effect. And the way I got around it was they coded it as hormone imbalance. And um, just bless those providers. They were lovely. I was at the DC VA. And uh, so I then transitioned to construction where I had a colleague try to kill me. And I experienced slurs and being held to the man standard, quote unquote, because that's who I wanted to be, even when I was 120 pounds soaking wet and trying to carry a 150 pound piece of pipe up 12 flights of stairs, which is like against OSHA rules anyways. So there were just a really interesting experiences of being held to or being exposed to messaging that I didn't want to repeat. I didn't want to intake, but it's taken a lot of time to actually work through and deprogram myself from a lot of it. And uh, now that I'm where I am in life, I'm actually between things. I'm reevaluating everything I want to do with my life. And like I pursued a um, fancy, shiny business career for years because I thought that like that was the thing that got me through community college and into Williams and through Williams is like, I want that because you don't see any trans people who are portrayed as successful, who are portrayed as having a steady job or any of these things. Like to be the message that I had always been told was to be a proper queer activist, especially a trans one, you need to be broke. And I'm not okay with that. Like I have lived where the dollar menu was a splurge my roommate and I did once a week. Like I have lived in ways that I never want to go back to and that I would never wish on somebody else and with instability. And uh, like the VA disability payments have been be what kept me out of the streets after a couple too many nights spent couch surfing it in my car. The next round time that came around, I had the VA disability payments and suddenly I had a safety net. And so for me, like chasing this fancy corporate career was the thing that would one, say that, okay, I don't ever have to worry about this again. And then two, be that thing that says, no, it's actually not stylish to be hungry and wondering where your next meal comes from, because then you can't actually like be your actualized self. Like you're too busy trying to survive. And it, then comes a series of health things and now I'm like realizing maybe I don't want to work those many hours in a week and I love arts so what can I do next but at the heart of it is still this love of storytelling this love of like we have to protect the little ones and the animals like that's really what is at the heart of this is like if there is a kid in somewhere in the middle of nowhere who just if I could have known that people like me existed when I was like 12, my whole life would be different. And so if there's something I can do, even as I'm reevaluating my life, even as I'm 
working on policy as I'm uh, like doing all of these different things, if it in some way means that somebody else has hope that I didn't, then uh, if I can be or help facilitate a message that is opposite of what they're getting, where they are feeling like they will never find love, that they're not worthy, et cetera, et cetera, I want to do what I can by through being visible through the work I do to make sure that every trans person knows that they are worthy, that they are capable, and that we do want to celebrate our each other's joys, their joys. We like to be queer and to be trans is to be an entrepreneur of self in a lot of ways. We are constantly caught up in this most creative process of being yourself. And like, what's not to celebrate about that? Like, it's fantastic. So it's just, that's what being visible means to me is to be able to, to give hope, to give hope and to acknowledge the fact that not everyone wants to or can be out, but I'm in a really fortunate position now that I'm in Massachusetts and I'm cis passing and I'm white and I have all these privileges. And, you know, there's a lot of privileges that also open up. Like my, my service dog has literally opened doors for me um, and metaf metaphorical ones as well. And because she's a great conversation starter. She's been to the White House. She's done all of these things. And I haven't had to figure out how to introduce myself because she came first. And so like, if I can use that privilege, I should. And hopefully, this work means that I can get one step closer to a world where I can run off to the mountains and live and trade on acorns. And like, we can not have to worry about bills and basic human rights, like, and just celebrating each other's joy becomes celebrating joy rather than having to flag it as celebrating Landon's trans disabled veteran, blah, 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 blah joy. Like that's the, that's why I'm visible. Cause someday I would like to have a generation where it doesn't matter. Thank you for that. And Landon, I mean, it was really powerful. And this has actually come up in, you know, my research um, as I study um, student veterans, specifically in the higher ed landscape. That's a very common notion of, for me, I'll use me as an example. I just want to be Linnea, not look Linnea the military spouse or Linnea the woman of color who works in the veteran community you know so to speak it is I just want to be myself and model how and what that looks like to others for them to just be themselves um you know uh so to speak so that's really powerful thank you and so I know that we are um running up close to the hour. So I'll let um, audience, audience members put um, any questions that they may have in the chat. But one last question that I have for you all, what can we as allies do to support you in either building that hope or, you know, changing the narrative that, you know, what it means to be transgender isn't necessarily what is portrayed in the media of either, you know, only the negatives and that there are many things to celebrate and so forth. How can we as allies support you? What, what does allyship look like? Um, I will go ahead and uh, throw my answer in really quickly. Uh, super simple, see something, say something, hear something, say something. We are in so many situations where we hear somebody say something that's absolutely abhorrent. And we don't want to be the one that says anything. We don't want to be the one to rock the boat. But the thing is, is I have so many people stand up for me when I'm in the room. I have so many people stand up and say, oh, don't say that. That's offensive when I'm right there. Um, but when I'm not in the room, you still have to do it. You still have to work. Because the thing is, is we are dealing with a, a societal problem. It's society's understanding and view of trans people that is the problem that's leading to all of these questions around our basic human rights. And so the easiest way to change that is to make people uncomfortable. Normally, I don't like to shame people. However, yeah, Shame them, shame them for saying things that are inappropriate and uncomfortable and hateful and bigoted. Make sure that you stand up for us when we are not in the room, just as much as you stand up for us when we are there. That's how, that's how you effectively become an ally.
Well, not to be controversial, but I disagree. <laughs> that won't surprise Avalisa, though. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm never going to be dehumanizing towards other people because I don't want them to be dehumanizing towards me. So I don't take the tactic of shaming people. I don't want to be shamed. Um, I think that my, what I think of when I think of an ally, I think of somebody who gets to know us. You can't get to know us very well because we're not a monolith. So you're not going to meet all hundreds of thousands of us around, around the world, but get to know trans people outside of Twitter and Instagram, get to know trans people who are doing very different things, live in rural areas, have labor, more, you know, labor jobs, who are in law enforcement, who get to know people uh, who are trans and many different identities under the umbrella. I personally, I don't want anybody to speak for me ever, right? It's not, I don't, I don't want people to do that because I find that all often they're not really speaking up for me, they're speaking up for somebody they know um, and so you can speak up for an individual, but maybe not our community. I think we can speak for our community. Um, I, I don't like the idea of allies being advocates unless they want to be an advocate for their specific position. I'm the partner of, I'm friends of, I'm, you know, I'm the parent of, I get that kind of relationship. But um, I, think it, I think we have enough visibility now that we, we, we've got the baton, we can run with it. Um, and, but we need partners to get ahead, right? Socially, politically, you know, occupationally, we need partners, um, but it's like, it's give us, give us the, the podium now. We can, we can take it from here. And that's, and that's my personal opinion, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, again, fall somewhere between the two of you. Um, so I, again, I was in some, What's the proper phrasing? Um, I've been in a bunch of different work environments where different, that have required a lot of code switching. And I've been in ones where shaming would be a, absolutely the appropriate response to something because the only language was like playful dehumanizing. Um, it's not a culture that I wanted to see continue, but it was one that like I had to speak the language as much as possible in order to get through. Um, on the other hand, there is this difference between calling out and calling in and to call in is to ask somebody like to, to actually bring them into the conversation and to educate and to do so in a way that's not going to embarrass or shame but also keeping in mind that like you don't want to have be implicitly supporting um violence against somebody like there's this delicate balance of like social skills that really needs to happen um and i think for me allyship if so y'all have really well covered the like interpersonal aspects. I think for me, allyship is really important to think about like what Xander said about uh, passing the baton. Um, so when you're building policies, when you're building hiring um, programs, all of these different things impact trans people, even if you don't think it does. So think about the hiring programs for just about any major company and look through it and everyone has in their mind this idea idea of what a resume should look like we have a b c d thing and you had this trajectory but what happens when you have a work gap during some year in college from a relatively recent graduate what happens when you have a sudden change in industry without like or it's a gap or gaps without graduate school um how do we think about these things when you're hiring somebody or background checks when it's going to bring up interesting information um thinking about those gaps in work those are very well could be like medical reasons those could very well be transition related reasons and so how do we think about all of our processes and all of our systems in a way that actually actively support trans people and bring more voices to the table. So you need to think about if it's, hey, we're building this policy, is there a consultant we can bring in? Who can we pay who is trans, who has all of this different research and aggregate data about what the trans community faces as well as their own lived experience and the skill set to help us build the most trans inclusive, LGBTQ inclusive policies we can when thinking about hiring, when thinking about family leave, all of these different aspects. Um, that's what it means really to me to be an ally is because I believe it was, um, excuse me, I believe it was Elvis, 
Evlissa who said that we're dealing with a systemic problem and we are. And so if we're dealing with a systemic problem, let's look at the frameworks that support it. And how do we start disassembling those frameworks and rebuilding them in a way that really truly is supportive. And to think about it, like I think about it like this, we've got sidewalk cutouts and we really like them. Everybody likes sidewalk cutouts, but they originally weren't designed for everybody according to like design folklore. And so if we can think about designing our policies at scale, um, no matter how small or large you may think it is, in that same way, then I, while bringing trans folks to the table to make sure that it isn't just a, oh, good ideas fairy, and it actually is something and approach in a way that is humanizing and respectful and also will meet needs, then I think we're in a really good spot. Just bring us to the table. We can co-create something awesome. Thank you. That was really helpful. And I think, you know, even though Xander and Evelissa, you know, um, Xander, you had put it that you, it was a contrast statement. I think that there is a lot of overlap there in terms of, I see my role as an ally of giving space, hence, you know, us being here today for you all to tell your stories and share. How can we uplift and amplify you where we're not hijacking your narratives, but we're lifting you up so that way more people can hear it. Um, and so, um, and I'm with you in terms of like, how do you, we call them courageous conversations here at WSP. How do you have a courageous conversation to say the things that you necessarily are uncomfortable saying, but you know that they need to be said? That's what courage is. And so having those conversations with folks of being like, hey, when you said X, Y, and Z, that might have come across, you know, this way. So, you know, have a conversation or an intervention in terms of like breaking up that microaggression or what we call subtle acts of exclusion, so to speak. And then Landon, to your point, you're spot on in terms of how can we be intentional when we're building policies and processes and communities to ensure that everyone has a voice. And again, not speaking for others, but who are we inviting? I call it, who are we having coffee with to be able to to learn so that way our brains start to be able to say, oh, well, if we create this policy, this could impact you know, X, Y, and Z population. So being more intentional and diversifying our network so that way when we do come to a crossroads of making a policy or a decision, we can reach out and invite people to those conversations so that way we can collectively work together. So that was really powerful. So thank you. And thank you all for spending the time to share your stories and your experiences um, and teaching us and allowing us to grow. And so so forth. Um, I know I learned a lot and I hope that others that joined us today learned um, a, a fair amount and hopefully we can stay connected so that way, again, we can continue to work together to uplift and amplify. So I also want to give a great shout out to our WVEDS team um, that include Whitney and Lisa and Lil and Samantha and Alina. Um, thank you for allowing us uh, to make this event possible today. And I want to close out with a poem that I typically um, it, I theme it based upon something that we're we're discussing today. And so um, I found Joshua Jennifer Esp Espinoza's uh, poem, who is a transgender poet, um, and just wrote a beautiful piece that I feel like kind of captures some of the things that we were discussing in many of the themes. Um, so the poem is called The Haunt. And so it starts with, California is a desert and I am a woman inside it. The road ahead bends sideways and I lurch within myself. I'm full of ugly feelings, awful thoughts, bad dreams of doom, and so much love left unspoken. Is Mercury in retrograde? Someone asks. Someone answers, no, it's something else. Like that, though. Something else like that. That should be my name. When you ask me, am I really a woman, a human being, a coherent identity, I'll say no, I'm something else. Like that, though a true citizen of planet earth closes their eyes and says what they are before the mirror. A good person gives and asks for nothing in return. I give and I ask for only one thing, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Bear the weight of my voice and don't forget, things haunt, things exist long after they are killed. 
So again, really just finding that way to get people to hear you and to amplify those voices is, you know, what was powerful about that, um, that poem there. And so um, let's find ways to stay connected. Um, feel free to uh, go to our website at warrior hyphen or dash scholar.org so warrior-scholar.org um, and then sign up for our newsletter to get up to date on events that we're doing our next w event wveds is on monday march 27th um, at 1 p.m where we will have dr quinn galloway salazar who will come um, and speak to us about how we can come together to tell the stories of women veterans and how we should be working all year round to collect these stories and amplify them um, so we hope that you can join us then as well. So thank you so much, uh, Xander, Avalissa, and Landon for being with us today. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, thank, thank you. you Take good care. Likewise.